And as I say, the Republican health care plan, we're going to get to that, too. The, 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 again, just to repeat, first glance at this, I'm scratching my head and saying, why? Does anybody not know what insurance is anymore? This isn't insurance. That's what, what, what health care, Obamacare, what's all this stuff supposedly is about is helping people afford insurance, right? There's nothing about insurance in this. It just looks like we're finding ways for everybody to be able to cover every medical expense they've got. And if they can't afford it, we'll find a way to subsidize it. It's an asinine. The views expressed by the host on this program make more sense than anything anybody else out there happens to be saying. Great to have you with us. L. Rushbo at 800-282-2882. And the email address, lrushbow at eibnet.us. Hey, I'm going to move on to some other things besides this investigation, Trump's story. We can always circle back to that, but there are, uh, of course, other things such as the Republican release or unveiling of their Obamacare repeal and replace plan yesterday. And it's it's deep. You know, it's esoteric. It's, it, it's so complicated that that alone... Uh, raises red flags. Now, I know President Trump has tweeted about it today, and I want to share the tweet with you. Don't worry. Getting rid of state lines, which will promote competition, will be in phase two and phase three of our health care rollout. Don't worry. Okay, so we're supposed to say this is phase one. May not be everything you want in it, but don't sweat it. It's coming. And he's intent. He's been on this since he got into the campaign, and that is eliminating the restriction on insurance companies from selling across state lines, which would be a great thing if they put it in there. Right now, insurance companies can only sell in certain states, and sometimes there's only one insurance company left in a state selling health insurance, so there's no competition whatsoever. But that, folks, is way down the list here. Um, that, that should have been any repeal and replace. But i tell you what's missing here. And it's such a sad thing. What's missing here is the Republican Party doesn't seem to want to trust the market. And what appears to be the case, and I, I largely believe this is because what Republican donors want. Sadly, this is a fact of life. They want health care to be an entitlement. There's obviously much financial benefit to somebody or a series of somebodies if there are aspects of American health care that feature entitlements. But the first thing I noticed about this is that it isn't insurance. And that's what, when you get right down to it, I remember when this all started, when I first became aware that it was a big thing to people. Now, you would think my instincts would have me aware of this from the get-go. But I've always bought my own. It's just, you know, I, I've, I guess I've been fortunate. Um, and I don't use it. I've been very fortunate on sicknesses and illnesses and, and so forth. So uh, I remember, was in Missouri. I was in Cape Girardeau, my hometown, on a on a on a, just a vacation, see the family, and I went out at lunchtime one day with to, to a restaurant with a bunch of my brother's friends. They were all business owners, and they were just belly aching and whining about how much it cost them to provide health insurance for their employees. And, there's a, and this is, folks, this is this is going to be 1990, 1991. And they're beside themselves. It's destroying their businesses. They can't afford it as it was required by law. They can't afford what their employees expected and stay in business. And something had to be done. And this is right on the verge of Clinton being elected. And here came Obamacare 1, which was called Hillary Care, which we succeeded in beating back and preventing, if you'll recall, by really destroying Hillary's nationwide bus tour. <laughs> Remember that, Mr. Snurdly? <laughs> every hill, she started in Seattle. She's going to end up in Washington. And we had it so that at every stop, there were 20 times many protesters as there were supporters. So they had to change the route of the bus, <laughs> go places that were not announced. <laughs> yeah, it's called the Healthcare Express. 
it, well, we prove that we can do uh, we can do civil disobedience then. Uh, at any rate, so then I started I started actually uh, learning about it, getting into it, and at that time, what the the expense was for the providers, which employers, was insurance. The insurance premiums were out of control, were unaffordable, and something had to give. And the the debate on health care back then largely focused on, well, it focused on everything, cost and all that, but the insurance side of it was the focus, making sure everybody held health insurance because it had gotten so expensive that people could not afford it on their own. And immediately, for some reason, instincts are what I began. Why can't you mean they can't even afford to, to make an elective trip to the doctor for a checkup? Well, no, they can't afford that, but they don't want to pay it. This was shortly after a Democrat senator by the name of Harris Wofford from Pennsylvania, and this is prior to the Democrat convention in 1992, came out and said, if the Constitution of the United States provides you a lawyer when you can't afford one, then why the hell doesn't the United States provide you a doctor when you can't afford one? And that's all she wrote. That got picked up. Everybody thought that was brilliant. And so it it became almost a, 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 an assumption, contention, and an assumed right that health care paid for by somebody else should be part of the American way of life. And the, the first stage of payment in health care is insurance. The other phase of expense is, of course, the actual care and treatment, and then that varies. You have the elective trip to the doctor, but then malpractice insurance got so unwieldy that people started, doctors started testing people for everything under the sun, even when they knew there wasn't any reason to, just to cover against a malpractice suit. So people started getting more health care than they actually asked for or needed. Uh, again, as a defensive measure against lawsuits. So you can't throw the tort bar out of this equation. But it, it quickly hit me. And I'm, I was late to the table on this, but it, I realized when I immediately started studying it, the primary problem with American health care was that government getting involved in it, Medicare, Medicaid, 1965, destroyed the entire concept of market forces determining the cost of services and products based on what people can afford. Most everything else in our life is priced on what people can afford to pay for it. I like to use the example of hotels. If you don't want to spend much, you can go to a Motel 6 or some equivalent. If you want to go whole hog, you can find some luxury place that'll charge you $20,000 a night. But whatever you choose, there's no insurance for it. You just choose what you want, what you can afford, or what you are willing to pay for it. And that's the market providing options and incentives. And as long as there are people willing to spend X for, there's, if enough people want it, it'll, it'll be provided. Have you ever wondered why, if I may make a diversion here to, ex, to explain the point of markets, have you ever wondered why in the aviation business, since the first Boeing 707 flew on commercial flights, we're going back to the 50s and 60s for this. Have you ever wondered why outside of the Concorde, we don't fly any faster today than we did when jet commercial travel began. The average speed of your average airliner today is going to be between 500 and 550 miles an hour. Not knots to be in the upper 400 knots range. I'm talking miles per hour. Ground speed. I'm not factoring winds. I mean, but that the, 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 the uh, engines that have been developed, that's the speed. Why don't we travel 
why why don't we have the ability to travel at 700? You know, the, the speed of sound is 760. Why don't we fly at 700 miles an hour? Why isn't that option out there? Why can't we fly a thousand miles? Are there enough people that would pay what it costs? Well, it turns out no, because it turns out in travel. The cost is a much more important factor than speed. And the thing about air travel is also physics. The faster you fly, the more fuel is required. Now, that may sound like it's common sense. But the reason for that is not just thrust. The reason is the faster you go, the greater amount of air you have to fly through and displace. And that air is resistance. Whether there's a headwind or not, there's still, and the faster you go, the more power you use in your jet engines, the more resistance there is. And so it has been established by the people in the business that the most effective speeds at cruising altitude for efficiency and economics is 500 to 550 miles an hour at that speed at that, at that usage of fuel, at that usage of thrust, you can price various seats on an airliner from the lowest coach fare up to the highest first class, and the airline can theoretically on a full flight make a profit on that flight. And they reduce it to how much it costs per seat to buy the airplane, not to make the trip. So if an airplane costs $100 million or $150 million, the way they amortize it is to figure out how many trips at, at full capacity with an average price does it take to pay for that plane, not how much are we spending per trip. It's a, it's a, and it's just been decided. Market forces have mandated that 500 to 550 miles an hour is it any faster and the costs expand incredibly. You wouldn't believe it. Do you know when the when the Concorde was still flying, it was shelved in 2003. Do you know what it cost when that plane was shut down to fly one way New York to London or Paris? No, it was $10,000. Do you know what the seats in the Concorde were? They were coach seats. It was a small airplane. There was no luxury in that airplane. The only reason to fly to Concorde was if you wanted to get there in three hours instead of eight. But they couldn't find enough people willing to spend, at one time it was $7,500 one way. They couldn't find enough people to spend ten grand to save five hours on the trip. So the way the commercial airlines do it, if you'll notice when you go to London or Paris, you'll depart at 7, 8, or 9 p.m. at night, and you'll sleep overnight like you normally would, and the plane arrives morning in London or Paris, which you would normally be getting up at about that time. And then you spend most of the time theoretically asleep, so you're not aware of the time passing. And people have shown they'd much rather pay a much more economical fare and spend eight hours getting there than to spend $10,000 and get there in three hours. Now, the ability to fly 1,200 miles an hour, we have it. The ability to fly 800 miles, we have it. It's just, it's not economically feasible. Now, what if there were speed insurance available? What if you wanted to fly? to London in three hours, and you demanded it, but you could only afford a fare of $1,500, and you demand the government make up the other 8500 What do you think people would say? Screw you. I'm not paying to subsidize you just because you want... Well, this is what's happened to health care. Now, I'm not comparing the necessity of health care to flight. I'm talking about market economics here. There is very little in healthcare that is priced anymore based on what a consumer or patient can actually afford. Now, if you have a catastrophic disease, nobody is saying that you ought to be able to afford that. That's what the insurance ought to be for. The insurance ought to be for what you can't afford, like when you have fire insurance in your house. You are hoping it never happens. But if it does and your house is destroyed, you don't have the ability to pay it. That's, that's what the insurance is for. And that's the bet that you make. It's a bet. You're wagering that your house is not going to go up in flames. 
And that's what you're paying for. Coverage if it does. Same thing with a catastrophic illness. If you come down with a terminal illness or you're in an accident and the health care that you need is, is prolonged and expensive, no way does anybody expect you ought to be able to pay that. But you ought to be able, if you need to go to the doctor for a checkup, damn it, pay for it. But those days are gone because no, now people think that whatever is related to their health, that somebody else should pay for it because health is sacred and there ought to be no class or economic differences in health because we're all human beings and illnesses don't discriminate and, you know, the drill. So that's what's been accepted is that nobody should have to pay for their health care. It's just how our system has evolved. And so markets are not trusted. Markets are not dependent on uh, even by the supposed free market Republican Party. Instead, now it's all political and people think that, well, I, I, I shouldn't have to spend my money on health care. I, I should be able to go out and buy something else with it. And that's where we are. Uh, after years and years, decades of the American population being, I don't want to say programmed, it's becoming accustomed to the accepted reality that somebody else is going to pay for your health care. When, in fact, nobody really pays, you always end up paying in ways you may not ever see. You may not write the check or give them the credit card, but you end up paying for it one way at a high tax rate. I mean, any number of things. Um, so I was hoping at some point that an Obamacare repeal and replace would really feature an attempt to return to market economics in those aspects of health care, not insurance, health treatment, that makes sense. And that the health insurance would be for those things that it would be totally unreasonable to expect most people to be able to afford. That's why you have insurance on other things. You insure your house against flood or against fire, theft, or what have you. You are not, when you buy fire insurance, or you, you don't get, your house is on fire, you don't have insurance, you don't get to call the insurance company and buy a policy right then for a hundred bucks. You, you're SOL. If you don't have insurance and your house is on fire, tough toenails. But it doesn't work that way in healthcare, and it should. And of course, then we get into the old arguments, well, who gets sick and who needs the most health care versus who doesn't get sick and who needs the least? And the premise of Obamacare and Hillary Care was that you young people who are healthy and don't get sick and you're not even thinking about long-term illness and death, you should be paying the freight for Aunt Emma over here who's in her 80s and can't afford it. And you're saying, I don't want to pay for somebody's Aunt Emma. I don't want to pay for any of it until I get sick. That's too bad because Obamacare means if it worked as designed, you'd be paying 80% of all this or 50 Anyway, there's much more to this, but I have to take a break. We'll be back in a sec. Okay, look at automobile insurance. How much do you think automobile insurance would cost if it covered oil changes? And for those of you driving cars old enough, grease jobs. What if your auto insurance covered gasoline fill-ups? What do you think it would cost? Well, that's where we are with health care. Health insurance now covers Band-Aids, for crying out loud, if you're in the hospital. Which can probably cost as much as 10 bucks. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. And I'll tell you this. As long as emergency rooms in America have to take everybody, you can kiss profit goodbye. It's all out of whack. And the fact that every aspect of health care should is, is presumed to be covered by insurance. We don't have a prayer of ever fixing this. The market will fix it, but we don't have enough people that trust it. And the reason for that is education. The American education system has literally corrupted the minds of two generations of Americans on capitalism. And free markets. At any rate, it's going to cost twice what this $500 example is. Here's the story. This is from Zero Hedge, but it is actually the source of this is the CEO of Assurant. Do you know what Assurant is? Assurant insures gadgets. 
Assurant sells extended warranties for things like iPhones, uh, iPads, TVs, dishwashers. Even if your Samsung dishwasher explodes, you can buy insurance on it. Did you know their dishwashers explode like their phones? Yeah. So, and it's this guy, the CEO of Assurant, that went out, because he's in the insurance business, he surveyed their customer base and a ton of other Americans and found some fascinating economic data. And he was on Bloomberg TV, uh, it was either yesterday or the day before, to explain why demand for his services is going to increase. The chief executive of Assurant, which is a mobile phone insurance company, said he expects a surge in demand as carriers begin to charge customers more to replace their devices. If you think back five years ago, you as a consumer, you didn't know how much your phone cost because you went to the phone company and you bought the phone and they practically gave it to you. Maybe $199 for the phone and you had to sign a two-year contract. The cost of the phone was built into your monthly payment, but you didn't have to come up with it up front. Now, all of the carriers have eliminated the subsidy. And when you want a phone, you pay for the whole thing up front now. And that's where this survey comes in. Now you're paying $600 to $900 for a new phone. So we've actually seen the attachment rate or the number of people buying the product going up a little bit in the last couple of years. The reality is, after he did this market survey, half of Americans cannot afford to write a $500 check. This guy's name, by the way, is uh, Kohlberg. Alan Kohlberg. Now stop and think of this. Half of Americans cannot afford to write a $500 check. That's for anything. If they wanted to buy $500 of Skittles, they can't do it by writing a check. Which means they do not have, half of Americans do not have $500 in their checking account that's not allocated to something. And he spun that statistic by saying that when U.S. customers sign up for a cellular plan, they are willing to buy insurance for their phone because the, the last thing they want to lose is their phone. The last thing they want is something happening to their phone. If they lose it, they want a replacement immediately. If the screen breaks, they want it fixed immediately. If something else about the phone breaks, if it, if it breaks, if it stops working, they want it fixed immediately and they will pay out the nose for insurance for their phones. And all Jason Chaffetz was saying was, isn't it kind of interesting that people who can't pool together 500 bucks will still find a way to make monthly payments on insurance for their phones, and yet they don't think they should have to for their own health care? It's simply a value judgment that people have made. But I guarantee you, since there's no such thing as phone insurance in America, meaning there's no federal program that will buy you a phone because you want one, yet there is, there are numerous healthcare plants that will pay for your doctor visit, that will pay for your hangnail, that will pay for whatever you need. And so if somebody else will pay for it gladly, but there's no way you can legally find somebody else to pay for your phone. So you, the point is that when people, something they really want, they'll find a way to get it, and they'll find a way to make sure they continue to use it if something happens to it by buying an insurance plan on it. In other words, there are millions of Americans who do not have $500 in the bank, but they are willing to dish out more than that on a phone, and then they will make monthly payments that are way beyond $500 to insure the purchase. They can't afford the insurance. They don't have $500, but they'll find a way to make it fit into a monthly payment somewhere. Now, it's also true you can't buy health insurance in monthly payments, right? You have to pay for it. People... Uh, depends on what kind of coverage you're getting. If you just, if you want, 
instant replacement, instant repair, that's going to cost you more than what they'll advertise. It's, you know, if you can wait two weeks for the phone to be replaced, repaired, or whatever, then that, that, that's the entry, entry price. We've had these, some of these guys as sponsors here at EI. I've talked to them about their business. I know exactly how they operate. And what, I'll tell you what, when we were first approached by somebody that wanted to advertise the fact that they insure, I said, well, what? never heard of this. Oh, you did. And they set out to tell me how big a business it is. And I have to admit, to you, I was shocked. And I said, well, don't the carriers provide some kind of insurance that's part of the month? Yeah, but it's not. It's nothing like what we can tailor to every buyer. And it turns out it's a huge business. And I had no idea. And it's strictly, you know, the idea of insuring a phone just, but to a lot of people, the, phone, the point is here, Chaffetz chose the iPhone as his example of a, of a desired purchase versus health care. And I don't know whether he was aware of this survey or not. If he wasn't, he is incredibly prescient because he was making an actually salient point. It's come off as being critical of buyers, critical of people. And, of course, since it's a Republican, that's how they want to report it. It's mean-spirited extremist Republican thinks you should give up your phone and pay, pay for your own surgery or whatever it is. You know how they distort news whenever it involves a Republican. But if people really want it, and apparently they want their phones and they want insurance against anything happening to the phone, they'll pay for it. They will find a way to even the people that don't have 500 bucks a month in their checking account or in their back pocket will find a way to pay for it. Monthly payments, loans, what have you. But when it comes to health care, are you kidding? No way. Where's my blue cross card? Where's my this? Where's my that? And that's what we're up against in actually fixing health care, which is a major, major obstacle. I have to take a break. Okay, we'll come back here and we'll get to your phones, which will take us back to the investigation. By the way, there's another survey that goes along with this $500. Do you have it or not story? Bank rate did another survey. And they ask people, if you came on hard times, what would you first get rid of? And six out of ten people said that they would eat out less. The least likely to face the chopping block, mobile phone plans. People will hold on to their cellular coverage as the last thing they have to get rid of. They'll stop eating out. Then they'll stop eating then they'll stop drinking. Then they'll stop getting rid of the cell phone. Cell phone plan is the last thing they will do. According to this bank rate survey, only 35% said they would cut back on their wireless plans to save money. Let me ask you about your home insurance. Another question about your home insurance. Let's say you like scented candles in your home because maybe your dog stinks. Other family members stink. Or they just household aromas you don't like. So you like scented candles. But now it's time to leave house. Maybe you're going to go to the movie. Maybe you're going to go somewhere. Do you leave the candles burning? You blow them out. Why? Why do you blow them? You blow them out risk of fire, right? You have a smoke alarm in your house. Many of them, depending on how old your house is, require. You can't move in or buy one without one. Do you make sure it's working out? Why? Well, I don't want to smoke alarm. I want to be able to get out of there if there's a fire. Exactly. Look at what you have to do in order to get homeowners and fire insurance. And if you didn't blow that candle out and your house caught fire because of the candle, they might accuse you of arson and they wouldn't pay off. So you know that. So you may. Why isn't any of this stuff applicable in health insurance? Well, we know the answer to that because it's been turned in to an entitlement because the people behind it want it to be something over which they have control of people. But we're never going to fix it. Uh, you know, our, our white comedian, Paul Shanklin, who does many of our parodies, he sent me a copy of a bill for a family of, uh, let's see, 
this uh, father, mother, four people, family of four, 36-year-old father, 34-year-old mother, the kids are ages two and six, 1999, and it is a bill, and the premium is $145. And let's see, is this uh, health insurance cost? I don't know if it's monthly or for the year, but it's 1999. And if you remember 1999, everybody was complaining about the cost of health care. Then, outrageous, $145. Uh, I really can't tell if this is a month or a year. The deductible is $4,500. So I'm going to assume this is a monthly 145. Anyway, you know what it is now? 1400. 1400 for the exact health care plan that in 1999, now admittedly that's 18 years ago. It's a long time. But back in 1999 everybody was complaining about how much it cost then. And look what's happened. With Obamacare and all kinds of attempts to fix it, look what it's the same thing that's happened. The government gets involved in fixing your cable bill. What happens to your cable bill? It skyrockets. So 145 bucks a month versus fourteen hundred dollars a month today for the exact same health insurance policy.